This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Gelatinous Cube One of the most iconic dungeons in Dragon's Monsters is, of course, the... Huh? What? No. No, not the dragon. No. Yeah, it's in the title, but lots of things have dragons. Dungeons and Dragons didn't really invent dragons. One of the most iconic Dungeons and Dragons monsters is the... The Beholder? No. Well, I mean, yes. It is a monster unique to D&D, and it was on the cover of one of the first books ever published for D&D, but it's been reproduced a lot, and it doesn't really say anything about Dungeons and Dragons. It's just a horrible sphere covered in laser eyes. And really, laser eyes? No. One of the most iconic monsters in Dungeons and Dragons is... No, not the Demogorgon. You're only saying that because you watch Stranger Things. Besides, Demogorgon is based on a myth from 400 CE. D&D was invented in the 1970s. Look, we've got an idea. How about you stop guessing what we're going to say and let us say it? Because the thing is, D&D has a lot of iconic monsters. It's been around for 50 years, and it's gone through a lot of iterations. A lot of creators have touched it, and thanks to various intellectual property laws, quite a few monsters have actually been declared legally iconic. The problem is, though, that people have a pretty loose standard for what counts as iconic. The word iconic comes from the Greek word ikonos, which means resembling. An icon is something that looks like something else. At least that's what it used to be. These days, thanks to computing, we think of an icon as something representative of something. And that's due to it being a feature of computer operating systems that rely on a graphical user interface. That is, instead of typing instructions into the computer, there's images and symbols displayed on the screen that you can interact with. Now, the idea of being an icon entered computing in the 1970s, and the word icon was introduced by Dr. David Canfield Smith in his 1975 thesis entitled Pygmalion, a Creative Programming Environment. He posited that you could build a system for computer programmers in which different little pictures and symbols, what he called icons, would represent specific sets of instructions or computer code. Now, this was actually nothing new in electronics. It had become the standard to represent electronic functions on various devices with little symbols. You know, like the line and circle that represents on and off. Dr. Smith took his idea to Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center. Xerox Park, as it's called, has a pretty famous pedigree these days. While Xerox is the iconic photocopying company forever, the company has actually been at the forefront of technological development for decades. They were originally established in 1906 as a photographic paper and equipment manufacturer. In the 1930s, they developed the first process for photographically reproducing a document without using any fluids or wet chemicals. And they named the process xerography, which comes from the Greek and means dry picture. Anyway, Xerox Park. Xerox Park was founded in the 1970s to push the boundaries of electronic and computer technology. And the list of things that were first developed at Xerox Park include the Ethernet, laser printing, and the graphical user interface. That's right, Microsoft didn't invent icons and GUIs. Neither did Apple. Xerox Park did. And Dr. Smith was on the team that developed the Xerox Star personal computer that used a graphical user interface as part of its basic operating system. But. That wasn't the first time that the word icon was used to mean a symbol that represents an idea. In point of fact, that particular sense of the word icon goes back to the Eastern Orthodox Church, an offshoot of Christianity that originated in the Byzantine Empire after the fall of the Roman Empire. The idea is that if you create a representative image of a holy, divine, or sacred object, that image can be a stand-in for the thing itself in ceremonies and rituals. The image picks up some of the sacredness of the thing it represents. Now, this is one of the many differences between various sects of Christianity, and there was a lot of theological debate about whether iconism was such a hot idea. There were concerns that the worship of an image or representation might draw worship away from the thing it represented. That is, if you want to worship a divine figure, it's best to worship them directly and not worship a physical object. 
and even the implication that something divine and holy could be represented physically could be seen as sacrilegious. But the Eastern Orthodox Church was particularly cool with iconism. And around the turn of the millennium in 1000 CE, it became all the rage in Byzantium and spread across Russia. And it led to a particularly stern and serious art style that was focused on painting portraits of religious figures with as little emotion or embellishment as possible. And by the 1500s, the word icon had entered the lexicon, specifically as a work of art that represented a sacred or holy figure. And that is why, today, when we say a monster is iconic to D&D, we don't mean that it merely resembles the game we love. What would that even mean? We mean that it stands in for the idea of the game itself. It's impossible to think of the monster without thinking of the game. Which brings us back to where we started. In our opinion, there is no monster more iconic to D&D than... The Gelatinous Cube. Yes, we're serious. Just hear us out. While the Gelatinous Cube has been reused occasionally in other games, all of those games are notably derived from D&D. For example, NetHack and the Wizardry Computer RPG series both feature Gelatinous Cubes, and both were attempts to computerize the tabletop dungeon delving experience particular to Dungeons & Dragons. And as for its origins, the Gelatinous Cube was invented by E. Gary Gygax himself and appeared in his very earliest games of D&D. Now, one of Gygax's otter quirks, and one that informed the earliest versions of D&D, is that he seems to have some sort of fixation with oozes, blobs, slimes, and fungi. The original book of Monsters and Treasures, which contained only about 50 monsters, and that's counting four different qualities of horse as well as mules, the original Monsters and Treasures book, packaged with the original Dungeons & Dragons game, described five such beasts. The ochre jelly, the black pudding, the green slime, the gray ooze, and the yellow mold. And the first supplement for the game, based on Gary's own home game in the dungeons beneath the castle of the same name, Greyhawk, introduced even more, including the fungus queen Zagig, whose name is Gygax spelled backwards with one letter changed, and the gelatinous cube. Now, a lot of explanations for Gary's strange fascination with oozes and slimes have been proposed, but the most likely is just that Gygax was a big fan of sci-fi pop culture and he grew up in the 1940s and 50s, and he was entering his 20s in 1958 when the iconic sci-fi horror film classic The Blob hit the screen. If you've not seen the film, you owe it to yourself to check it out. Produced by Jack Harris, directed by Irvin Yeaworth, and starring the iconic 1960s bad boy actor Steve McQueen in his first leading role, The Blob tells the story of a... a thing that falls out of the sky with an errant meteor. The jelly-like organism begins to creep and leap and glide and slide across the floor. The splotch, the blotch, consumes everything it can, growing larger and larger. It's simply a mindless eating machine. The only thing that can stop it is extreme cold, such as might be found in a movie fire extinguisher or the Arctic Circle. But we don't want to give away the ending. Go watch the movie. Seriously, iconic easy listening music and commercial jingle writer Burt Bacharach wrote the theme song, and it's delightful. The thing is, though, that the blob wasn't the first shapeless mass to consume everything in its path in the science fiction genre. In fact, slimes and blobs and oozes were practically ubiquitous in pulp sci-fi stories in the 20s and 30s. The title character of a story called The Ooze was even depicted on the cover of Weird Tales in 1923. In 1926, a slime appeared in a competing publication, Amazing Stories, in a story called The Malignant Entity. And of course, in 1929, H.P. Lovecraft introduced the Shoggoth in the story by the same name. It was a disturbing, shapeless, formless entity that could crush a human in its pseudopods with its brute strength and could shift its shape and imitate speech. However, the first mention of such a creature in the literature came in 1907 in a short story by Charles Edmund Walk entitled The Odile. In that story, 
The blobby creature is actually an accidental creation of a scientist who is studying new ways of producing cellular life by way of the amoeba. Now, the amoeba is a single-celled organism. Unlike animals and plants, which, as we have mentioned before, are made up of multiple living cells that are grouped together to make all the tissues and organs needed to produce complex life, amoebas are examples of a simpler type of life. Much simpler. They are actually generally classified as the second simplest form of life on the planet Earth. See, all living things on Earth can be divided into five kingdoms, animals, plants, and fungi we've talked about before. But then you have single-celled organisms known as Protista and Monera. Protistas are protozoans. That comes from the Greek and it means primitive or original animal. But it is also a reference to the Greek god Proteus, who was a shapeshifter. And if you take high school biology, the iconic protozoan you study is the amoeba. Now, once upon a time, scientists really didn't have to classify single-celled life. Primitive microscopic technology didn't allow much more than a glimpse at the largest single-celled organisms and allowed very little detail to be discerned. So, all super tiny living things were called protozoans. It was a general class. But then, in 1757, a naturalist in Germany named August Johann Russell von Rosenhoff was able to describe and depict in detail a particular protozoan which he named amoeba for the Greek word for transformation. And that's because, unlike some protozoans, amoeba do not maintain fixed shapes. They are basically just blobs of cellular material. The practical upshot of that is that amoeba can extend pseudopods, or false feet, from their body to move around or gather food. They can even surround or engulf food. And their food includes bacteria, other protozoans, and even lone plant and animal cells. But it was around the turn of the 19th century and early 20th century that new medical and microbiology advances allowed for deeper, more complex classification of protozoans and amoeboids. In fact, it turned out that even von Rosenhoff's amoeboids were actually a member of different specific species. And because of those scientific developments, single-celled life was featuring in the scientific literature of the day, specifically the 1890s and 1900s which is probably what inspired Walk's short story about a giant single-celled organism that was basically just a blob of goo that engulfed everything in its path. So by the time Gygax was creating Dungeons and Dragons, there was plenty to inspire his obsession with blobs and slimes and goo. But what was special about the gelatinous cube? Well, it was likely included as a joke. Because it was a blob of slime, cubicle in shape, that was exactly the right size, 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot, to sweep along what Gygax defined as a standard dungeon corridor, engulfing everything in its path. Thus, the gelatinous cube was a slime that was uniquely adapted to a dungeon drawn on graph paper using a 10 foot per square scale. That's pretty iconic for D&D, no? especially given that the gelatinous cube is also a fantastical representation of a science fiction creature. See, D&D was a blend of various science fiction and fantasy styles, as we've discussed before. While it was definitely inspired by fantasy stories by Robert E. Howard, J.R.R. Tolkien, and Poole Anderson, among others, it was also inspired by science fiction tales like the various post-apocalyptic worlds of Jack Vance that directly influenced the magic system of D&D. So, a sci-fi creature adapted to a fantastic dungeon drawn on graph paper captures a lot of the spirit that inspired the world of Dungeons and Dragons. But there's another reason why we think the gelatinous cube is particularly iconic of D&D. It's not just the blobby, slimy part. It's also the shape. It's a cube. And do you know what else comes in cubes? One of the most important elements in gaming ever. Dice. Dice come in cubes. And a bunch of other shapes as well. A die, which is the correct singular of dice, and people who call a single die a dice drive us bonkers, we must add. A die is a small polyhedral object that is used to generate random numbers. And we hope you knew that. The most common die is the six-sided die, which takes the form of a cube. And dice have been around a long time. A long time. For example, 
Sophocles the Greek playwright, who lived around 450 BCE, claimed that dice had been invented by the heroic Palamedes during the Trojan War, a war which had happened at least seven centuries prior in the 12th or 13th century BCE. And Herodotus claimed they were a Lydian invention dating back from the days of King Attis, and he ruled in about 2000 BCE. And archaeological records have demonstrated that both the ancient Greeks were wrong. Dice are even older, and we don't know how old. The first written records of dice come from the ancient Indian epic the Mahabharata, which was written over 4,000 years ago. And examples of cubicle dice have been found in the archaeological record in various places. We have Egyptian dice from 2000 BCE and Chinese dice from 600 BCE. Although dice are, and probably always were, used in games of chance, that's not how they got invented. In fact, the first dice were likely shards of bone carved with mystical symbols that were used to divine the future. Such tools were usually made from small ankle bones from sheep, buffalo, or other animals. They were called astragals, or knuckle bones. And even today, in some parts of the world, knuckle bones are still used to predict the future by diviners, mediums, and spiritualists. In point of fact, that's why dice are often called knuckle bones, or simply the bones. Interestingly, though, while we think of the cubical six-sided die as the normal one, the fact is that the pyramidal or tetrahedral four-sided die might be just as old. One of the oldest board games we have ever discovered, complete with a board and game pieces, comes from the Sumerian city of Ur. It was being played in 3000 BCE, and it used pyramidal four-sided dice. So the four-sided die is actually the Ur example of a die, even though the six-sided cube is the most iconic of the dice. But we can't discuss dice, especially role-playing gaming dice, without discussing Plato. Plato was, of course, a great Athenian philosopher who lived sometime between 430 BCE and 350 BCE. He had a lot to say about a lot of different things. He wrote about ethics, he wrote on politics, and he wrote on geometry. Now, the ancient Greeks loved geometry. A lot of their math was based on it. By the time Plato was writing, other Greek mathematicians like Pythagoras and Theodotus had identified five very special three-dimensional shapes, or polyhedrons, that were unique in that each face of the polyhedron was made up of an identical shape. Moreover, the shapes that made up each face were regular shapes. The length of each side was the same. You had the tetrahedron, which was a four-faced object with four triangular faces, the cube with six square faces, the octahedron with eight triangular faces, the dodecahedron with twelve pentagonal faces, and the icosahedron with twenty triangular faces. You might recognize them as the d4, the d6, the d8, the d12, and the d20. And what made these shapes special was that they were the only shapes in the universe that followed those rules, congruent faces made of regular polygons. And they really are, though it took mathematicians a long time to prove that mathematically. To the Greeks, they were perfect shapes. Now, Plato was very concerned with the nature of reality, which is fair enough. He was a philosopher. And he figured that those five perfect shapes had to mean something, or else why would they exist? So he associated four of them with the four classical types of matter. The four-sided tetrahedron was fire, the cube was earth, the eight-sided octahedron was air, and the twenty-sided icosahedron was water. The last shape, the dodecahedron, he felt, was the shape that was associated with the heavens, the cosmos. The twelve sides matched up with the twelve major constellations in the sky, after all. And thus, those five shapes became known as the platonic solids. Now, we do have to mention the poor odd one out. The ten-sided die is not a platonic solid, and in fact, it didn't appear in the original Dungeons & Dragons game. Most people think the twelve-sider has it bad. The poor ten-sided die doesn't even exist. And some people even think the ten-sider wasn't invented until 1980 when it was announced at Lake Geneva's Wisconsin Gen Con gaming convention. But that's not true. There was a new development made in dice technology at the time. 
It was a 10-sided die with clipped corners so that it would tumble better and therefore produce more random results. The 10-sided die was actually first patented in 1906, though it's unclear what it was used for. The patent does identify it as for use as a game apparatus, and it was to be marked with numbers and letters that represented different cards and different suits. Also, if you're wondering, the proper name for the shape of a 10-sided die is pentagonal trapezohedron, which means it has trapezial or kite-shaped faces, and that it can be split into two five-sided pyramids. But back to Plato. See, this whole platonic solid thing played into a core unifying aspect of all Plato's philosophies, platonic reality or platonic idealism. Plato noticed that we humans had certain conceptual understanding of things that didn't technically actually, you know, exist. Take numbers, for example. We can count two of something, but what actually is a two? Have you ever seen one? Or take a circle. A perfect circle is a curve whose length is precisely 22 sevenths of the distance across it. Yeah, the Greeks didn't use pi because they didn't believe in numbers that weren't perfect fractions. The thing is, no matter how good an artist anyone was, Plato knew no one could draw a perfect circle. It was something we understood and could even describe, but something that didn't actually exist. It could only be represented. Plato posited, therefore, that there were ideas and concepts that existed completely separately from any imperfect physical instance of them. They were concepts and ideas that could only be represented by symbols, by icons. And that, listeners, is why we say that of all the iconic monsters in D&D, none is more iconic than the gelatinous cube not just because it was a completely original monster invented by the game's creator, not just because it was a deadly bit of whimsy he used to torment his players, not just because it represented a merger of science fiction and fantasy themes, not just because it could only exist on the graph paper which was used to map out the dungeons in which the game was played, and not just because it is the same shape as the dice that are a central part of the game and have been a part of gaming for thousands of years, but also because it is directly tied to the very concept of iconism itself, as expressed by Plato. It is symbolic of symbolism. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Mm -hmm.